Okay, we're now recording. Okay, fantastic. Um, so what, what I was going to suggest, maybe, uh, Tim, you and I, we can start out, maybe you and I can um, share some takeaways from the conference, point to um, some, some relevant links. I know in particular, um, pointing to your uh, demo link will be um, useful if folks haven't seen that yet. Um, and then we can we can open things up to um, questions from folks. We've got a couple couple people who uh, don't have mic access, so we'll we can use both the chat and the um, audio for questions that folks might have about the conference. Okay, that sounds good. Um, do you want to start off? I'm trying to find my notes. I'm sorry, I'm running sure I can, here. <laughs> sure, I can start off. So I'll. Um, what I'll do is I'll I'll share some um, links here in the Zoom chat and then um, copy those um, the same links uh, back over to the wiki page um, after words. But I want to um, the the first thing that and this was a, a really nice surprise um, for me at the conference. Um, Tim and um, Andrea Bellini and I. Uh, gave a workshop on um, using the DSpace 7 REST API. And I think the, the thing that was um, most interesting to me was we had um, about, I think 40, 40 to 50 folks in attendance. So, um, you know, people from various parts of the world who use DSpace, many people I had never met before. So just kind of got a, a much clearer sense of the, the size and breadth of the DSpace community. So that was, um, an interesting thing to see. Um, I'm sharing here uh, in the chat a link to the slides um, that we put together, as well as um, in addition, the, those slides will link out, but there's there's a set of <clears throat> exercises that we also created sort of to um, help people step through um, using the REST API. So this, these, this material is there if uh, and if you have an interest, um, you can sort of use uh, this material to ramp up on the DSpace 7 uh, REST API. And we've got a, a sprint coming up in a couple weeks that's uh, a great opportunity to get involved if you're interested. Um, so definitely uh, want to highlight that. I think it, it was um, particularly useful for me. I'm, I'm relatively new to working with the uh, um, new REST API code base and really interesting to hear some of the vision that's in place for that um, that part of the infrastructure. Andrea Bellini's really sort of designed things in a way that the, the API itself will be self-documenting and taking advantage of a lot of um, open tools and standard approaches to really, uh, you know, make it so as the code is written, um, the supporting documentation to go along with the code will just sort of um, be generated and be available for folks. So that's that's uh, some material I definitely um, recommend to people. Um, and then what I'll do, since we're kind of just, uh, if we're, we're sort of taking turns here, um, I can, I'll just uh, mention a couple other things that um, I presented and then I'll take a turn sharing some of the um, highlights from some of the talks I attended and then probably ask uh, Tim to do the same. So if any, if folks have questions along the way, feel free either to chime in uh, the audio channel or to um, post a message in the chat. Um, so another um, talk I was excited to present, Claire Knowles from University of Edinburgh and um, I shared sort of our approaches to trying to um, introduced uh, IIIF uh, presentation of images um, into our repository. And um, so it was, it was interesting just kind of hearing the, uh, sharing our common stories along the way of, you know, what, what we wanted to accomplish and the ways in which it, it caused it, the existing repository model sort of uh, doesn't exactly work when you're, um, working with IIIF, so some of the, the, you know, sort of new approaches to content that we've um, each taken on in trying to integrate IIIF. So, so very excited by the possibility. I think it, it offers ways to present material that uh, 
hasn't been possible before, but it also sort of the, the notion of what's a collection or what's an item, those, those concepts become a little bit blurred when you um, start working with IIIF content. So that was a, another one I was excited to, uh, to present. Um, there was another uh, talk that um, I gave with, uh, it was, I was part of a panel, um, several folks were um, presenting. And this particular um, talk was on developer workspaces. So several folks were sharing the different tools, different approaches that they're using for uh, working with their repository software. So we had, there was a talk on Vagrant, on Docker, and then I shared some work I've done um, using uh, running DSpace on a Code Envy, on the Code Envy service, which is essentially, it's sort of like Docker in the cloud and an interesting way to provide a full um, development, build, test environment that can run within the tab of a browser. Um, or that's accessible from the tab of a browser. Uh, so anyway, just kind of sharing um, reasons why folks were, were looking to different tools and some of the pros and cons of each um, approach people followed. Um, and so I've got two more that I'll, I'll just uh, um, share the links. So I also um, put together some slides. Um, huh, make sure. Okay, uh, this is a, a set of slides for um, working with uh, the Solar Admin Console and try learning how to query um, the statistics repository in particular. So I sort of stepped through the process I went to to understand what's in the stats repository and gain some comfort with querying Solar directly. Um, and I found it to be a really empowering way to understand kind of the content in the repository. And I've got this uh, set up as like a little tutorial you can use with your own repository and kind of kind of explore what the content that's in there and learn how to use the Solar Admin Console to um, understand what content's being indexed and uh, what content is searchable. Um, so that was another one uh, that was uh, exciting to put together. And the last, um, one I wanted to share is uh, the DSpace, in DSpace 6, there's a set of tools um, for reporting on content. It's really designed for repository managers. This has been in DSpace 6 um, since the first release, um, the, but uh, it seemed like as, as DSpace 6 adoption has grown, um, this is a, probably a good time to remind people the functionality is there. So this uh, presentation kind of went through and um, described what the tools are able to do and um, how to access and make use of these uh, reporting tools. Um, so Drew, particularly if you've just upgraded to DSpace 6, I, I'd recommend um, if, you, if you did decide to enable the REST API, take, take a look at um, these tools and see if they could be helpful for uh, repository management. Um, and those slides uh, should should be able to help out there. So, so those are some of the, the key presentations that, that I made that I wanted to highlight. And then I'm gonna just pop up and mention some other um, notes that I took during the um, conference that I was particularly um, excited about. As, as I mentioned, I really was, like one of, one of the best things for me was, um, uh, just again, uh, getting a better sense of the the breadth of the DSpace community. I, I feel like I met several folks from um, Texas who I've never encountered in other DSpace meetings, but good to hear that there's there's a lot of sounds like a lot of DSpace experience at different institutions there. Um, uh, in the course of the the workshop um, that we did on the REST API. Um, it was really helpful to hear Andrea explain different um, spring components that are being integrated into the code base and, and just getting a, a better big picture understanding of um, some of those components. Um, I found, 
I, both of the keynote speakers at the conference pretty interesting. Um, the the first speaker was talking about um, having developed a fan fiction site and sort of um, wanting to provide preservation and access to fan fiction that has been contributed by multiple authors for many years, but kind of an interesting thing she was describing was often the authors of fan fiction don't necessarily want to be identified. So there is a need for preservation, access, indexing of material, but then also kind of this need to maybe um, honor the the privacy of the the actual authors themselves to not not necessarily want to be identified with their works and some of the the components that were um, that were put together to to make that possible um, the closing keynote was a um, speaker from Israel who has um, maintained I, I guess the largest collection of um, digitized material written in Hebrew and just he had some stunning statistic like that there were I, I forget there was some number he quoted like seven million um, Hebrew speakers in the world and this particular site has like five million unique monthly visitors um, each month so just like that this is such a useful resource that such a large percentage of the Hebrew speakers in the world or actually visit this site to, to access um, digital, um, digital content. So but both of those were pretty interesting. Um, I attended a, a, a talk that University of Pennsylvania um, presented and they, it sounded to me like they have built their own preservation system and use some interesting components. They were using something called CEPH, C-E-P-H, um, which sounds like it's it's like an open hardware component, and this open hardware component emulates the Amazon S3 interface. So they're sort of, I guess, using APIs as if they're using a cloud service, but then relying on uh, local hardware components. I just I thought it, it was intriguing to hear that developments have been made in that space. I don't I don't necessarily imagine that's something I would be looking at for us but um but just that thought it was interesting to hear that such a thing existed and they were using something called git annex to um track changes to large files and just just from taking a look at what git annex is is it it's like it it simulates checking something into git so it does sort of the fixity checking of a Git operation without actually making a copy of the material. So it's, I guess, particularly well designed for really, really huge assets and to provide some some integrity checking um, over the material. So, so that that was that was one I just I was intrigued that um, such a project existed. We um, we use Academic Preservation Trust as a preservation repository and. Um, I was just I I was excited to hear a presentation from the lead developer of that system um, talking about building a um, a tool to create uh, bag files for ingest into the their AP Trust preservation repository and we we've got some custom code we've written that performs that operation so I'm I'm excited just to hear that a component may come along that's provided um, that we may, we may be able to replace our custom software with something from the uh, AP Trust community itself. But what was particularly intriguing to me was this application has been built on Electron. And Electron is the platform that um, underlies both the GitHub desktop software and the Atom editor. So it's, um, it's a, a framework uh, produced by GitHub that's meant to be cross-platform. And I just had assumed it was um, some sort of simple cross-platform GUI framework, but it sounds like the platform itself has some ability to um, run jobs and, and other tasks. So, and somehow Electron is built on Chromium, which is the open source 
sort of base that Chrome is built on. So um, anyway, it was just, just kind of intriguing to hear this technology being um, used in our you know, library technology space. So those were, those were the key highlights that um, I wanted to mention. And um, you know, feel free to ask questions now, and then what we can do is have Tim, Tim um, sort of describe his experience. Also, I see that um, BK Elm has joined, and I'm not actually sure who that is. So if you want to do a quick um, introduction, either by audio or by chat, it'd be great to know where you're um, joining from. So I'm joining from Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Oh, great. And just appreciate all the information you guys are providing. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any questions from folks? All right, Tim, would you mind um, kind of doing that? A couple questions going into the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Terry. Okay, great. Um, so do you have a link to the AP Trust integration project? You know, I I don't have one. Um, I'll I'll take a look and see if I can find it um, and post that. Okay, and I will note actually that um, uh, while while you're typing in things, I'm going to add in a couple links here because I was gathering links while Terry was talking. Um, some of the talks were recorded. Uh, but only in the one, there was one room in particular that, uh, that had the recorded talks. So I just paste in these links. So there's a YouTube channel that has all the recorded talks, which is about one fourth of the talks. There were four rooms going on, but it included both keynotes. So Terry mentioned both the keynote speakers. They're both in that uh, recorded sessions in the YouTube channel. And I would recommend uh, giving them a, a quick view if you get a chance. They're, they're a little long and that they're both about an hour or so, but they're quite inspiring and interesting sort of talks to just kind of uh, sit with maybe over a lunch or something. Um, and only the Ballroom A talks were recorded, so the full conference schedule is that second link. Um, anything in the Ballroom A uh, you can find in that YouTube channel um, as being previously recorded and you can kind of watch at your own desire. Um, but there were three other rooms that that were not recorded and are not available, unfortunately. But just wanted to note that as other resources here. Um, and then I guess I'll go ahead and I guess Terry, is that it from your standpoint? That's you it for me. And I'll I'll, I'll kind of as you're talking, I'm going to look and see if I can find a better link to share um, for the uh, stuff from the AP Trust. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then I did want to note that uh, I did send an email summary, which I'll link in here again to the DSpace community list, uh, kind of giving an overview of, of some of the DSpace talks, the more um, DSpace specific roadmap talks, uh, things we're working on, the workshops that we um, that we performed earlier on day one at uh, open repositories, things of that nature. So if you haven't seen that, email summary that has a, a lot of the links that I'll be sharing here as well. Um, Terry already mentioned that there was, on the first day, day one, we had two workshops. The first was that REST API workshop that Terry noted, um, which was taught by Andrea Bellini, Terry, and myself. Um, the links to that are here. So we have both the, the slides are available as well as online exercises, which Terry had mentioned um, that he's built out. And I would uh, encourage you to kind of take a look at at the the exercises, especially as kind of a way to get get your feet wet on DSpace Seven REST API and get a sense of how how things are working out there. Um, I won't go into that in any more detail, other than to kind of just second um, Terry's mention of those. But we did also have a second workshop that same day on the Angular user interface. Uh, which was primarily taught, taught by Art Lowell, but I also kind of contributed at the beginning of that. Uh, this is a, a second uh, or an updated uh, talk based on the presentations at Open Repositories last year. So we gave a similar Angular UI workshop last year. This was kind of an updated version of that with the latest code base. Um, and we have uh, the slides available publicly as well as the resources around um, how how the uh, or what resources uh, art used, especially during the walkthrough portion of the of the workshop, the second half of it. So, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Angular user interface and just how to code in Angular, this is a good place to kind of get started. It kind of walks through 
some of the syntax of the Angular user interface and Angular in general, uh, TypeScript, which is the language it's built in, which is very similar to JavaScript, um, and walks through a couple exercises near the end around kind of making small modifications to the DSpace Angular user interface to get a sense of how things uh, interact and how you would uh, make various changes within that layer. Um, so that's worth looking at as well as you're starting to get more familiar with DSpace 7. Um, at a general standpoint, the main talk that I gave was the DSpace 7 update talk, which was near the end of the conference on Thursday. It was not recorded, but I did uh, record a demo of DSpace 7 afterwards. So that's here. The slides themselves are at that tiny URL. Um, and I re-recorded the demo and put it up on YouTube after Open Repositories was over. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that demo, um, we got a couple oohs and ahs and people were pretty happy afterwards, got a lot of compliments afterwards on the work that's gone into DSpace 7 and, um, and how it's looking so far. Uh, the slides themselves, uh, cover a little bit more than the demo. So there's a little bit more detail in there around uh, what's coming in DSpace 7, some of the features around not only just the Angular user interface and the REST API, uh, but also that we're gonna be adding in a new concept called configurable entities. Um, and that's kind of a, a data model layer enhancement to allow items to, to represent um, uh, actual types, actually have typed items. So an item could actually be uh, not just a generic concept of it, you know, it's metadata and files by default, but that an item could represent something like it could be an article item, it could be a journal item, and then you can actually relate those together. You can say this journal issue item relates to several article items, and we can actually store those relationships within DSpace in this configurable entities model. And you can also build new types of relationships within DSpace. So we're also talking about representing uh, people as items. So an author could be an item, and an author could have his own uh, relationship with the various um, articles that he or she wrote, uh, so that you could represent those in sort of an author splash page or an author profile page within the DSpace user interface. Um, this is a newer concept within DSpace 7, and we're still building it out, so we don't have a demo of that within that recorded uh, demonstration. But um, I want to promote this because we will be um, creating a brand new um, configurable entities working group coming up here within the next month, sometime in July. We're going to have a public call here for uh, folks who want to join into this work and actually start to build out these, these concepts within DSpace 7. We have a general design we're building towards, but we just need to help in actually making it happen and making sure we're meeting all the use cases and needs that folks have laid out in that design. Uh, there was also more information about configurable entities specifically that came out just after open repositories in a statement from the steering group. And I'll just link that in here. Uh, so this was post OR, post OR 2018, um, and it just has uh, links off to some of the resources around why this decision was made um, and what the general design is, is uh, we're, building, we're building from, is, is linked off from there as well. Uh, and I see Jordan asked, the entities of DSpace 7 are the ones already available in DSpace Chris. Uh, the goal here with these new entities concept is actually to bring the core DSpace code closer to DSpace Chris. So we're trying to align the two projects more and more. <clears throat> I don't, I cannot promise at this point in time that all the DSpace 7 entities will be exactly those that are in the DSpace Chris model, but the goal is to kind of bring those together over a series of releases so that DSpace Chris will eventually just be sort of a configuration of the out of the box DSpace um, project, a configuration or maybe even like a small add on. Um, so it's definitely in lining us up with DSpace Chris, uh, but whether that all happens in DSpace 7 or whether part of it happens in DSpace 7 and the rest of it happens in DSpace 8, that's still yet to be decided based on how much we can achieve uh, in the development in the coming months. Because we're not wanting to delay DSpace 7 for several years. We're really pushing hard to get that out. Uh, in early 2019, and we'll get as many of these entities into it as we can by 2019, but there may be a line we'll have to just draw at some point in time and say, you know, we're gonna have to cut it off here. We'll get the rest in on 
in DSpace 8 and beyond. But it's very much in alignment with the DSpace CRISP project. And it also comes out of us trying to align with, um, with the goals of the open air version four guidelines out of Europe, as well as the core next generation repositories recommendations. And both of those have been linked off of that last link that I shared here uh, from the steering group statement. So there's more information about each of those there if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, Let's see, the other thing that I did want to mention that's coming in DSpace 7, besides the Angular UI, the REST API, and configurable entities, is we have other alignment with the next generation repositories recommendations, which I just mentioned. Uh, so we're working towards having resource sync out of the box in DSpace 7. Uh, there's links to that out of that slide deck or that DSpace 7 update slides. If you want to learn more about resource sync, it's bas basically like the next generation version of OAI PMH, but it allows you to actually send and harvest not just metadata, but also files um, to actually sync things between two different locations, two different repositories. Um, so there's that coming. There's also a support for signposting, which will be coming in DSpace 7. Uh, that's another recommendation out of the next gen generation repositories. This is more for um, for kind of harvesters or machines, uh, it's basically a, a, a best practice for embedding information about uh, your repository within HTTP headers. Uh, and it's kind of a, more important for, for harvesters or, or spiders or things of that nature because it will, allows us to do things like uh, when a spider or harvester is harvesting, say, an item, item splash page, rather than them having to download the entire item splash page and search for the link to the PDF within that item splash page. Instead, via signposting, we can provide a direct link to the PDF within the HTTP headers. And when it's in the HTTP headers, that means they not only don't have to download the entire HTML, they can just grab the headers, but it also allows them to jump immediately to download the PDF if that spider is really interested in and gathering PDFs or things of that nature. Uh, there's more information at signposting.org on that. Um, and that's also linked off the slide deck as well. Uh, so that was all presented as part of the DSpace 7 update. Um, I also gave that demo of, of how the Angular user interface currently looks right now, including some flashy uh, demonstration of the, of the submission and workflow functionality. Uh, I won't go through that here today just because that is available on YouTube. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. The other thing I think that I mentioned is, oh, the roadmap. Um, so I'd, I mentioned briefly here that uh, the goal is really to kind of get DSpace 7 out in early 2019. But the first goal that we're trying to meet before that is to get a beta release done by the end of this year. And so that'll really tell us if we're on schedule. Um, and how things are progressing. And by a beta release, we essentially mean we want to have something that is testable by the community that community members can download, install locally, and start to bang against and report bugs back on. Uh, it may not have every single feature in there yet, but hopefully it has 95% of the features that are coming in DSpace 7 would be in that beta. Uh, so to give a really good sense of what DSpace 7 is going to look like by the end of this year. Uh, and then the next deadline would be a initial release candidate, which would be feature complete. Uh, that would come in early 2019. That would be another opportunity for folks to download and bang on it, report bad bugs or issues they're seeing. And then shortly thereafter from that, we would put out the final release, hopefully within a matter of weeks. But it really is dependent on the number of bugs we locate and things of that nature. But um, the overall goal is early 2019, we would have DSpace 7 out. And um, at Open Repositories 2019, we would do more user training and, and upgrade training and things of that nature, how you can customize your user interface and things of that nature um, for, that would be of interest to most institutions wanting to install and use DSpace 7. And the last thing that I'll mention that I promoted kind of throughout the conference is um, the upcoming DSpace 7 sprints, which Terry mentioned as well. Um, uh, the DSpace 7 sprints are listed from this tiny URL. The next one is coming up in July here, uh, July 9th through 20th, I believe it. Yeah, 9th through 20th. 
Uh, there's no requirements for um, for how much time you put into a sprint. You could come in and join for one week. You could join and just grab a ticket or two and help out. But we will have coaches available to help you along with actually uh, uh, fixing bugs or making small improvements to the REST API and the Angular UI. Uh, the last time we ran these sprints in May, uh, we had uh, several new people who had never worked with DSpace 7 before. Terry mentioned that he didn't have a whole lot of experience with the new REST API, but yet he learned a lot on, on the ground there and then helped us with some of the training at open repositories. We also had a couple folks who had never even uh, submitted a pull request to DSpace ever, uh, submitted their very first pull request as part of those DSpace 7 sprints. Um, so we'd encourage you to join up if this is at all interesting to you. No real experience required. We, we would recommend having experience with DSpace, of course, just to know the concepts, but you don't really need to know uh, DSpace 7. It's really an opportunity to just kind of dive in and start to really learn in a hands-on fashion and have those coaches available on Slack to kind of help out on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to really kind of help you uh, get past any roadblocks that you get along the way. Um, and I see Drew mentioned a direct link to the roadmap. Uh, the roadmap is is in the the slide deck from open repositories. We do have a a roadmap on the wiki, but I admit that I've been so busy since open repositories that I have not had a chance to sync that up completely uh, with what was presented at open repositories. So if you look at the uh, the roadmap is in the slide deck that's called OR 2018 DSpace 7. Um, in this tiny URL, it, it lists the roadmap for DSpace 7. We do also have a wiki roadmap, which is listed here. Oh, those URLs seem to have mashed together. Apologies on that. Let me try and separate those out. So here's the first one. And then we get the second one here. There's the second one. Okay, so there is a wiki roadmap. Uh, the wiki roadmap is not completely synced up yet with the DSpace 7 presentation at Open Repositories, but that is on my to-do uh, to get these two um, synced up. Uh, but that's where that information can be can be found. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else to note. I think that's the, the basics of it. I also in my in my email summary to the to the mailing list, I did also mention the repository rodeo, uh, which is something that I did not present on, but uh, Maureen Walsh, who's on our steering group, presented the DSpace overview there. Uh, so that also gives you diff a different perspective on what's going on in the DSpace world. Um, and she's got a more non-technical uh, perspective as a repository manager. So the, the slide deck from that uh, is linked here and there was this panel was actually recorded. Uh, so it's worth um, watching that if you're interested in this. Uh, the repository rodeo panel is a panel where all of the repository systems basically give brief updates on what has gone on over the last year, um, what's going on uh, with like Fedora, with Samvera, with, uh, with um, uh, ePrints, uh, with DSpace, of course, um, and any other the repository platforms that were there at Open Repository. So it gives you a good sense of kind of an overview of what everybody's been working on, what the directions are of each of the platforms. So if that's of interest, the slide deck is there and the full panel was recorded and could be streamed off YouTube there. Um, and I think that's all that I really had to report on. I admit, I admit um, my attendance at OR was, <laughs> was I got yanked into a lot of side meetings, which happens at open repositories. So I did not get to get to see as many of the sessions as Terry noted, um, but I did enjoy the, the plenary speakers, uh, the opening and closing plenaries. Those were quite, um, quite inspiring and quite useful. I'd recommend giving them a try on YouTube um, and, uh, and we'll see what other sort of links we can gather to other resources, I think, from open repositories that Terry was working on. So I think that's it for me, basically. Yeah, I got in touch with the um, speaker who presented on the AP Trust tools. Um, so I will, I just shared both uh, a link to the, um, make sure they're right. Yeah, so I shared out the, 
a link to his talk and the video of his talk. I had forgotten he was in the um, room where the recording was made. So if you're curious about that electron-based um, project, there are a couple links um, to that as well. And I'll, I'll also add, I mean, if anybody has any questions on anything that I talk through or on DSpace 7, I'm, I'm glad to answer questions here today. Uh, you can either type them in to the group chat or just, you know, unmute yourself and ask it that way too. I had a question about the changes to the API in uh, DSpace 7. Um, our metadata librarian has done a lot of really useful work in writing uh, Python scripts that, that code against first the, the DSpace 5 API and then we've updated it for the, the DSpace 6 API. And we're now using those on a regular basis in order to do uh, bulk uploads and uh, various metadata remediation um, activities for our repository. Um, it sounds like um, since you're changing the, the underlying uh, structure that the API is built on, um, obviously there's, there's going to be some changes there. And, and as you uh, come up with the new entities, there are going to be changes on that level. But um, will the, the API itself for the, the operations that um, continue to, to that, that have existed in the past and exist in the future, are those likely to change? Will we probably need to rewrite all of those scripts or are you making an effort to keep the, 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 the coding interface for those, um, those stable features um, stable? Uh, so when you're talking about the API, Drew, do you mean the Java API or the REST API? The REST API. The Sorry. REST API. Okay. Um, so the REST API um, in DSpace 6 and DSpace 5 is what you're using then? Is that what you're, you're saying? And you're wondering if that will change in DSpace 7? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so in DSpace 7, uh, yes, the REST API um, well, I'll give you two, two answers. First off, the, the DSpace 6 REST API is being ported to the DSpace 7 code base, so it will be still available in DSpace 7, but it will be deprecated uh, because part of DSpace 7 is we're, we're rebuilding that REST API um, from the ground up. Um, so we basically will have two REST APIs in DSpace 7 alone. As of DSpace 8, only the new REST a API will be available. Um, so, um, so you'll, you'll have an opportunity to be able to still use that existing REST API as is um, in DSpace 7 and then uh, port over your scripts uh, to the new DSpace 7 REST API. Uh, the reason why we are doing that is because the old uh, REST API, the one that's in DSpace 6 and below, uh, is not very featureful. It doesn't provide a whole lot of, um, it doesn't actually uh, provide access to all the features within DSpace, and it's also very sort of uh, custom. It's built without any really best practices or standards in mind. Uh, and so with DSpace 7, we've taken a, a major step. Well, we took a step back first to analyze that and make sure we, it wasn't really possible to move forward on the Angular UI, and we realized very early on that with the Angular UI, we needed to modernize the REST API both in terms of just making it featureful so that you could access everything through the REST API um, in DSpace, as well as we needed to align it better with a lot of the, the modern best practices around how do you build a modern REST API? How do you ensure that um, it is easy to use and sort of self-documenting? Um, and so that's what we've done in DSpace 7. So we have a demo. Let me show you the the demo REST API is linked here. It's hosted by Four Science, one of our service providers. Um, and if you go to that site, you'll notice there's actually a user interface here, uh, which is not something we built. This is a third-party tool called the HAL browser. And it, it's, um, it's one of these things that we've aligned with in terms of best practices. So you can now actually browse our new REST API through this HAL browser because we've, we've got a REST API that aligns with the HAL data format and and you can go scroll down and there's links down there in the lower left you can click those are all of our endpoints that are currently available in the dspace 7 rest api you can click into any one of those and get a sense of how the how it responds um, and how you can interact with it because as you uh, 
browse down to each link, there's, there's links underneath those. So it gives you suggestions on where to go next in terms of what you can do at each of these endpoints. So it's almost self-documenting in, in a way um, already, but there's also going to be a, a next step that if you look down at that links se section, there's several columns in, in that table. There's a docs column that's immediately to the left of the get column. Currently, there's nothing there, but it will be there. Uh, there's gonna be links where you can actually clink, click a, into the documentation from this user interface and actually see the documentation. And that documentation is automatically generated based on the DSpace 7 REST APIs uh, integration tests. Um, so it's basically a way that we're coding the REST API that allows it to be self-describing, self-documenting, much easier to interact with, and it also aligns with all the best practices and standards out of a modern REST API, and it also provides all the features that we need out of the Angular UI. Um, so this is kind of why we've had to uh, deprecate the old REST API in favor of this new one. Uh, but we hope everyone will see the huge benefits here. And we do give that, that, um, that DSpace 7 release will allow both to be a, available so you have that opportunity to migrate all your tools to the new REST API. So hopefully that is something. <clears throat> one of the features particularly of the new REST API that I'm, I'm excited about, and this is, this is still in development, there's going to be a parameter that you pass in when you make a request called projection. And that'll sort of help determine how much content comes back. So I don't know if you've tried with the older REST API to like crawl the hierarchy. Um, it's you, you kind of run into a, a challenge of either you don't get enough information back or you you kind of almost don't <laughs> need to pull the whole community collection, all the data about um, each object back in order to construct or replicate the hierarchy. And so there's going to be an intelligent way to say, I'm looking for this collection or I'm looking for this community and here's the projection of it that I'm looking at. And it will, it, the way I'm understanding it is if you're sort of navigating down the tree, you'll get the right return objects to help you descend the hierarchy. And if your focus is really going up the hierarchy, you can also um, set your objects in a way that you'll get uh, the, the right objects to navigate up the hierarchy. So, I think there's a, there more. There's going to be, you know, in addition to the, the fact that it's going to support all the operations of the UI. I think it's going to even solve some of the things that were difficult with um, the old API. Yeah, yeah. And I would highly recommend if you're interested in this, go back and look at that um, the the links from the DSpace Seven REST tutorial um, that Terry shared at the beginning and then I shared again as well in the, the slide deck there because that describes a little bit more of uh, all the best practices we're aligning with here with the DSpace 7 REST API and there's also some really good exercises that Terry developed uh, that allow you to really get a sense of how to interact with this and how the self-describing nature makes it really easy to kind of just get started and play around with it and get a sense of how to interact with that new API. And I see Drew uh, responded positively. So good to hear that you think the, the direction is good here because we're very excited about this as well. People don't tend to get excited that much about a REST API, but, <laughs> but if you talk to all of us about it these days, we're like, wow, this is so awesome. So, so yeah, you're gonna, I think there'll be a lot more opportunities to really build things against this new REST API going forward. If there's any other questions, I'd be glad to kind of answer them here as well. All right. Well, one of the things I, I'd like to mention is um, next month. I'm I'm um, adding a link to the developer show and tell meeting for next month. This kind of the the topic or the focus for next month was really came out of some of the conversation we had in that REST 7 workshop. So um, some of the exercises Tim mentioned really focus on using um, both that HAL browser, the, the sort of self-documenting um, component of the um, REST API, and then using a tool called Postman. And I don't know if, if that's something any of you have used, but it's sort of a generic tool for um, 
creating a, a REST client and testing REST APIs. Um, so we're gonna focus on tools that you need to interact with REST APIs and in particular uh, focus on Postman. So I'll probably um, represent some of the information um, from the workshop, kind of a, a shortened version of that. And then Art Lowell from Atmire has uses some of the more advanced features of Postman to uh, query against the Solar repository. And he's going to demonstrate um, some of those strategies that he's used and how um, he's been able to accomplish some interesting stuff. So I'm, I'm also hoping, in addition to those two tools, if folks have any other ideas around just in general REST API tools to kind of use that meeting as an opportunity to share best practices around those tool sets. So ideas are welcome if you've, if you've got any ideas or suggestions of other uh, tools that might, might complement that um, topic. And then I, I wanted to mention if, um, if you all, anyone on the call here has ideas of things that would be helpful or useful to tackle in a future one of these show and tell meetings, um, if you've got an idea now, um, go ahead and bring it up. And otherwise, also um, always glad to take those suggestions um, offline. All right, well, um, I think that it, um, maybe we should uh, go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, well, uh, Tim, Tim's been kind enough to capture these recordings and get those posted. So we'll, um, we'll add that to the wiki page. And then as um, Tim was talking, I went through and added to the wiki page for today's meeting all of the links. I, I may have duplicated a couple links um, more than once. But um, anyway, everything that uh, we shared, uh, at least a link to it should be there if you need to find it again. Sounds great. Yeah, well, thank you all so much for uh, for joining. Yep, thank you all. And definitely let us know if you have ideas for other developer show and tell meetings coming forward, because I, I, I agree that I see Drew noted that they're very valuable sessions. And I think these are a good point for us to all kind of touch base. So let us know if you have ideas of other things we can kind of help folks get up to speed with or anything that you'd like to present. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye, all.